Good afternoon. Okay, so this is going to be a talk about indexes. A little bit obvious, but yes. And it's an introductory tour. In other words, we're looking at the, the basics of it. We're not going to go into the, the nitty-gritty details of exactly how Postgres stores indexes on a physical layer. We're looking at, at how the general concepts. We're going to look at um, the, the different types of indexes, when best to use each one, look at a couple of examples of how to create indexes, how to best use them to take advantage of the indexing within Postgres. So first thing, um, a bit about myself. I'm a director at Apace Systems. It's a uh, company that does medical aid switching. Uh, it's about four and a bit years old now. And we use Linux and Postgres. The database that backs our system is Postgres. We do a bit of, bit of interesting thing there with multi-master replication. Spoke about a bit about it last year, and we'll probably revisit that in a, in a year or two's time. I'm a systems architect, a DBA, a sysadmin, and a tinkerer. I kind of do just about anything that I have to do. Okay, so first off, what is an index? It basically, in simple terms, helps the database find data within a table. Because without an index, you'd have to scan the table from beginning to end to look for the values you're looking for. An index just makes it faster. It, it, an index is, by definition, something that's very fast to search through to get you to look for a value, which then points to the places in the, in, the tab, uh, in the table store where you can find it. So it'll point and say, look in this block of this file, and that's where you'll find the record. So then it's very easy to actually go and obtain that data. An index can also be used to aid with the sorting of data. It isn't only used to look data up, but an index, or well, certain types of indexes, are implicitly sorted in order to speed the searching up. That with that, you can actually, if you query the index, you already get the data in a pre-sorted manner. So it can actually help with the sorting of the data. And it can be stored in an easily searchable, in an easily searchable way. I already mentioned that one. But all indexes take up a certain amount of additional space. Now, in general terms, that's very negligible. They don't take up a lot, but you just have to be aware that you can't just create an index for free. There is some amount of additional overhead, both in the creation, maintenance, and in storage for it. But databases will not use an index if the table is small enough. Because in order to get a value out of a table through an index, you've got first a read on the index, then a read from a table. So if the table's too short, you're actually going to increase your amount of time to obtain the data by first going through the index to get to the to get to the table. If the table's small enough, you just read the table. But the query optimizer in Postgres will make that decision as to which to use. So sometimes when you have an index, you'll look at the database and it'll say, using a sequential scan, you'll go, why is it not using the index? Because it'll actually be more or less efficient, more inefficient, to use the index as opposed to just reading the whole table. Especially if you've got something like SSDs backing your, um, backing your, hard, uh, your databases, it's that, that point at where it tips over from doing a sequential scan to using the index is often a lot higher. Okay, so just to rehash on that one, why do we need indexes? To allow a database to read less data from the disk. So instead of reading everything, we can read just a little bit in order to find it. In certain cases, it allows you to read blocks of nearby data from the, from the disk, which makes it even more efficient. So if you know that your data is in a certain range, you can request stuff from the database in a certain block of data. And then when it issues the read command to the, to the drive, it says, read this range of data, and it reads it back just fine. OK, you can read data that's pre-sorted. We've already spoken about that one. OK, so the types of indexes in Postgres. We've got a B tree. That's the default, that's the most common, it's the most used, it's essentially the normal type of index you have. We've got a gin index, a gist index, a spatially partitioned gist index, um, a brin index, which is a block range index, and then the hash index. But a note on the hash index, it's not safe to use before Postgres 10. Um, so up to Postgres 9, the hashes were, hash indexes were not committed to the, to the well, to the write-ahead log. And that meant that if you had streaming replication from master to slave, that the hash index would not persist through to the slave properly. And then if you did a failover to it, the index would be in an invalid state. The database would attempt to use it and wouldn't fail on it. 
And also, if you had to do a restore from a write-ahead log, then your hash index would be inoperative. OK, so let's look at the first type of index, a balanced tree. That's a balanced tree. All right. Essentially, you have a, you have a starting node. From there, you either go left or right. Um, and e essentially, the your, OK, this example is probably not so great because the um, they all on the same level, but a, a B tree within the database will not be more than one distant across the entire in t across the entire thing. Postgres will keep the tree balanced as it goes through. So that just means that it's fast. To, it's it's equally fast to search for anything anywhere in it. Okay, so all leaves are the same distance from the root. But I my example only had two per node, but there can be multiple children per node, and that's how it helps keep it balanced. The B tree is the most common type of index and the default. So if you don't specify using this index type, then Postgres will default to using B tree. So the, in, the operators that, that you can use in a where clause that will trigger the use of a B tree is less than, less than, equal to, equal to, greater than, equal to, and greater than. So the normal equality and less than, greater than type operators. And yes, there are more. We're going to get to other types. The like and the, the tilde in Postgres is to use a regular expression. Who does not know what a regular expression is? OK, that's good. So if you want to use a regular expression as your match, you can use tilde. Otherwise, you can use like um, to use the SQL style. Uh, but it will only use the index for a like and for a tilde if the pattern on, so in other words, column like and whatever's on the right of it is a constant. In other words, it's a fixed, fixed string. Or it's anchored at the beginning with text. So for in example, column name like foo percent will use the, the index. But column name like percent foo will not use it. OK, and the reason for that is if you take the first example, the foo percent, it will go down the index, look for F, go down, look for O, go down, look for O, and then grab everything under there as, as a result in that. But with the first one, you say it's going to end in foo. So where do you start in the tree? You'd have to traverse the entire tree to look for every node that ends in foo. So that's why you can't use a B tree for that. There is another type of index you can use with an extension that makes that problem go away. The case insensitive um, variant, the R like and the tilde star, well, you can use the index, but only if the first character of the pattern is a non-alphabetic character. In other words, a number or a punctuation of sorts. If it uses a normal character that, can, that has an upper or lower case, then it will not use the index. So the B trees can also use the between and the in operators. And that's just because with the between, it's essentially the same as a greater than, equal to, and a less than, equal to. So it's able to e extrapolate from an index. And the same thing with an in. It's just a whole bunch of equals. It's able to use the is null as well as the is not null um, operation, operators. And with, with indexes, you can also specify whether you want the nulls at the beginning or at the end of the index. So if you know that you're doing a lot of is null checks, then you can actually specify nulls first, and then it's, it sort of groups them a little bit better. And it's the good general purpose index. If you need an index, it's probably a B tree. The next type of index we're looking at is the GIN index, and that stands for Generalized Inverted Index. Don't ask why, just accept that. The underlying structure of a GIN index is somewhat similar to a B tree, um, and it's good for data that contains multiple values. So an, so an array that's got multiple values, the GIN is able to index each individual one. Um, the JSON-B types, where you've got key value pairs, the GIN index indexes those keys and values very well because it's able to handle and understand the multiple data types. HStore, which is sort of an antique version of the structure that eventually became JSONB, also can do that because it's also multiple types. TS Vector is for full text searching, again, and then range types. I'm not going to go into that one in too much detail, but it can also handle multiple values, so GIN index is perfect for that. And each in each index within the, or each 
yeah, there's an index entry in within the index for each and every possible value that's there. So it's essentially taking a B tree and just making it a lot bigger. So it's able to test for the presence of a specific value within, within the structure that you're doing. Gen indexes are the ones that are preferred for text searches. And one of the more common uses for it is the trigram extension. Um, and when you use a trigram with a gin, then you're able to do text searches within, um, within, a, within your database. So if, you have a, um, so if you have a field that's, for instance, a bunch of uh, just descriptions on something, you can use the trigram um, extension and gin indexes to build up that, the, all the possible values within there. So using the example, the words, the trigram extension breaks it up into parts that are no more than three characters long. And it pads each word with two spaces at the beginning and one at the end. So the first value it indexes is space space T, then space TH, then THE, then HE space. Now it's handled the first word. So the second word it has it as space space W, space WO, and so on, all the way to DS space. So if you search for something that like percent word percent, when it, when it runs through the trigram index, it breaks that one up again and then comes and matches using the gin index and it will match the, the presence of the words contains word. So gin indexes though, because of this, are generally a little bit slower to build because they're indexing a bit more, but they are very fast to use. We use gin indexes with a trigram to match descriptions of medical products. And we can search through almost anything, and it happens in about 20 to 30 milliseconds. And that's most of the SADC region, so Zambia and south of that. So even all of that, it matches it incredibly quickly. But because it's indexing more, it often takes up a little bit more space on the disk. Obviously, if you're storing each individual possible value within an, within an array, within a JSONB, or you're using trigram where it breaks everything up, it does take a little bit more. Gen indexes support a whole bunch of other operators. Um, the first one, the less than at, is, means is contained by. The next one means contains, then equals is obvious. The and and means overlaps and you're not going to go into the rest of them. They just start getting complicated. But obviously, if you have a data type that uses it, you will have a specific need to use one of those operators. Certain contrib modules, those are extensions like Trigram, can add operators. Certain data types also have varying operators. So if you have a text one, you might not have the question mark, question mark, ampersand, and so on types. And the Trigram one adds a couple of extra operators, the percent, less than percent, the, if you were at the post just talk, you would actually have seen the, the one that the, the brace, uh, less than, minus, greater than, it's sometimes called the tie fighter operator, and there's a good reason for that. The next index type, the just index, that's a generalized search tree. It's not a single type of index where um, B tree and gin were basically B tree indexes under the hood. The just index is any different type of combination of, or different strategies for, uh, for indexing can be utilized by a just. It's dependent on what data type you're indexing and what um, module and operator class you specify for it. And just indexes are the best for values that, that overlap. In other words, where you've got a lot of values that are very similar or, or the same, they can overlap, or We'll get to it a little bit later for GIS data where you've got range or areas that overlap each other. It can also be used for text searches like with GIN and it has a slightly smaller disk size but it has a slower performance. And the reason is that just indexes, they return more values and then we have to filter them. So with GIN and with Btree, when you ask an index for a value, you get the exact answer back. With just you will get back all your results plus a few extra rows. And then the query planner has to add an extra layer in there to filter out those extra rows. So you don't notice it from, from the perspective of the results. You always get the correct results back. The difference is that internally, because the just index returns more, because it's actually searching a little bit, it, it searches over a smaller space, it has a lot of false positives that have to be removed. 
but it is best for, the, for geometry or for GIS data. Uh, I've mentioned that one. And again, we've got even more operators to choose from. Uh, I'm not even going to mention half of them. And again, they vary based on the operator class of the index, uh, the data type, as well as contra modules, depending what you're indexing, how you're indexing, which module you're using for, for accessing the data, those operators all change. The next type of index is the space partitioned just index. And that's derived from research from Purdue University. And essentially what it is, is it takes your entire data set and partitions it into chunks. Um, and then essentially indexes it below that. It's not an equally balanced tree like a B tree or JIN index. It's quad trees, KD trees, radix trees, whatever is appropriate for that. So it's an incredibly unbalanced um, index. And it's specifically good for large data sets that have a natural clustering. So telephone numbers, for instance, we have a lot of telephone numbers that are all 011 or 012 or 021 or 082. Yet we don't have a lot of them that are in the 018, 019, I mean, if we even have those. So we have this, this, this immense clustering at one point. And then if you have a look at, say, an 012 number, you'll have a clustering again at 342. You'll have a clustering at 664. That sort of thing where, you, where each regional area has had a lot of clustering of certain ranges. And IP addresses on another one, we end up clustering around each octet, where certain octets like the 192.168, that occurs a lot. Or in South Africa, a lot of our IPs start with either 105 or with 41. So a, spatially partitioned, a space partitioned just index is best for that sort of data that has clustering. And that's why it's not a balanced tree. So you start off with, uh, let's take an IP address, 41, and then it will essentially go to that node, and then dot .178, dot .152, dot, and so on. And even more weird looking operators. Um, every time we seem to hit another one, there seems to be even more operators. Again, I'm not even going to attempt to explain half of them. I didn't even know when we start hitting the tilde ones, I didn't even know what they're for. Because <laughs> some of them are for very specific data types and that. But again, if you're using a space partition index, you go look it up on the reference material. It'll tell you exactly when to use which ones for what, for what data type, for everything. But those are all applicable to space partitioned indexes. All right, so the BRIN index is a block range index. And this is actually a very nice index if your data is ordered. And the reason is what it basically does is it takes blocks of data works out in simplistic terms what the min and max range is within that, within that block of, of, of pages and only cares about what that min and max is. So instead of storing the value for a million rows, you might store the min and max for 10,000. So if I'm looking for a, 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 let's just simplistically say, I've indexed a whole bunch of integers and I'm looking for anything that's 50,000. It wouldn't have to search everything to find it. It would say, OK, well, it's all the values that are possibly 50,000 are in these blocks. As in, and then the database will go and fetch that range of blocks and then filter it out from there. It only works for data that's l like large data sets that are ordered. So if your data is not ordered, it will not work. So for instance, a sales table where your, your, your sales come in and they're coming in date order, um, or, okay, that's probably the best example right now. Um, so anything that's in perfect order. So you always know that the order, if you had to sort the table and the native st storage of that data would be in the correct order, then you're fine. You can use it. I've mentioned the min max. If your data is not ordered though, then essentially every single one of these blocks, these ranges of, of rows, will have a min and max like that. So then it's essentially, if you search for 50,000, it's going to say it's everywhere, because it wouldn't know. Uh, new table pages are not always up, don't always update the range info. So you either need to, if you're doing a lot of inserts, you either need to call the Brin summarize range function, then runs through and updates the index. Or you can wait for a vacuum or an auto vacuum to kick off, and then it will run it. Or 
You can set the auto summarize parameter. There's a slight performance implication to running the summarization every time, but it does help with the Brin index. And we're back to simple operators, just the normal ones. Because in this case, if you're looking for a range, the database is storing a range for the index. If you're looking for a range, it's possible. And then there's a couple of other data types that add a few more, like the RNET for the IP addresses, it adds a couple more. And again, I'm going to reiterate this. Absolutely terrible performance if the data is not ordered. In fact, you probably find that the query optimizer will just simply ignore the index's existence if it thinks that it's indexing stuff across a too broad a range. Then the hash index, and this is the one that I said be careful with for anything before Postgres 10. Instead of storing the value itself within the index, it stores a hash of the index. So it's very similar to a B tree, but it can sometimes be faster than a B tree, especially on slightly larger data sets, because it's optimized to store a hash instead of storing different data types. But because of that, it can only handle any quality operator. So you cannot use less than, greater than, or anything else. The only option you've got is the equals operator. And that's important. Do not use it before Postgres 10. If you're using Postgres 10 or using Postgres 11 re uh, release candidate or whatever and soon to upgrade, feel free to use it. But compare. Compare B3 and hash. You'll often find that you don't get a major performance boost out of the hash, whereas B3 will just work fine. Okay, so this begs the question, which of these indexes do we use? I mean, we've had a whole lot of them, and you think, okay, well, B-tree, it was a gin, or what do we use it for? So B-tree works for most situations. And in fact, probably 99% of your indexes will be, unless you're in doing GIS data, 99% of your indexes will be B-tree. If you're wanting to index arrays or JSONB or use the PG trigram extension, consider using the, the GIN index. It works the best for those. If you're using GIS or geometry data, then use the GIST index type. You can also use trigram there. The general preference is towards the GIN index. With large data sets of ordered and clustered data, then space partitions just works best in that scenario. BRIN index for large ordered data sets where the data is in perfect order within the database or reasonably perfect order and the database is able to define min and max ranges for each block. Just a, a, a trick on that one, if you want to get your data ordered, you can create a B tree index on it and then cluster. Use the cluster command. It will lock the entire table, but it's essentially the same as doing a full vacuum, but in the, in the same time, it's going to make sure that the data is in perfect order when it's written to disk. It won't keep the order, obviously, because when you update a row, some value somewhere gets marked as available for reuse. So if you want to keep a data in order, you either never update or delete, or you just cluster and you handle the lock. And then a hash index when you only care about an equality operator. If you only care about an equals in your where clause and you're not worried about ranges, then a hash works fine. Okay, so let's have a look at, at how we utilize indexes and when, when certain indexes will get used and won't get used and so on. So simplistic case, a single column index. We say create index, its name on table, column one. And that's equivalent to the next one, create index name on table using B tree. So if you don't say using B tree, the database will handle that as a default. Um, the alternative, for instance, you could say using hash or using gin or using just. And to use that index, select star from table where col1 equals a. That's an easy one. That's sort of databases 101, but that's fine. A multi-column index or a compound index or composite index or whichever term you want to use for it, you say create index name on table col1, comma col2. And internally, the database simplistically concatenates the values together. So internally, it's only indexing one value that's sourced from multiple columns. And to use that, you can say select star from table where column one equals A and column two equals B. Then it will, again, simplistically say, I'm going to go look in the index for A, B. It's got a little bit more intelligence there so that it doesn't look for column one with A, B and column two empty, but simplistically speaking. 
the thing with a multi-column index is you can still use it even if you're not using all of the values that you indexed. So you can say select from table where column one equals A and it will still use this index because, because the values are concatenated, it's able to search through. So it's similar to doing a like A percent. It's somewhat equivalent to that. Again, I'm, I'm oversimplifying here. But if you have a multi-column index, you always have to specify them in order. So in this case, the where clause is only using column two. It's not using the first one that we specified when we created the index of column one. So in this case, it will not use the index. You can have 20 columns there. Okay? If you specify the first 15, it will use the index. If you specify the first one, it will still use the index. And if you specify the first one and the 20th one, it will ignore the 20th one when it uses the index, it will only use the first one. So with the multi-column index, always make sure you specify, or you specify the first column in your where clause that was specified when you created the index. Multi-column indexes are only supported by B-tree, GIN, GIST, and BRIN index types. You can't use it for hash or space partition GIN index, uh, just indexes. And you can have up to 32 fields in a multi-column index, although at that point it starts getting a little bit large to actually run the index. So the next thing we can look at is a partial index, and that's where when we create the index, we give it a where clause. So in this case, it will create an index of column one's values, but only in the case where the row's column two value is greater than 100. Okay? And where that comes in very handy is when you use a query like that, where you say select from table where column two is greater than 100. So then the op query optimizer says, but these where clauses match, I can use that index straight out of the box. And because I'm saying select star, it returns that entire index and utilizes it. You can use expressions in your, when you create the thing. So instead of just saying create index on table column one, you can say create index on table uh, lower column one. So the lowercase value for all of them. And then if you use the same thing in the where clause, it will match that. So if you just say column one equals value on a normal index, it will use it. In this case, lower column one, it will utilize that index. And you can even do it with string concatenation. So first name, concatenate space, concatenate last name, and use that as your, your index. And your where clause, it will actually match that and utilize that index. So if you do that, you can use any built-in or user-defined function. You can do arithmetic expressions, string concatenation. But the important thing to note if you use functions, they must be immutable. Now, functions can be um, stable, immutable, and volatile. So something that is volatile means that every single time you run it, it will give you a different answer. Okay? So obviously, you can't use that for an index because if I run it twice within the same query, I'm going to get a different answer. Something that's stable, uh, I've got to remember this one carefully, something that's stable will return the same result within the same query or same transaction, I think, and then immutable will always return the exact same answer no matter what. So if you have an add function that takes two values, one and two, you know that the answer is always going to be three. That's immutable. And something like the timestamp or now function is stable because it doesn't change within the same run. You can use it multiple times in one query and it returns that same value every time. But on the next query, it will give you a different answer. So for an index, it has to be immutable because when you build the index and when you use it, it has to know that the values would be same. So in other words, it's effectively a constant. Okay, so if we take, just go back to the, the simple index, we can, although it applies to multi-column, you can do a unique index. So you can say create unique index. And not only will that build an index, it will also enforce uniqueness. So if you try and insert another row, another row in the table with a column one value that already exists in the index, this index will kick it out. It will say you're violating the unique constraint, you can't do it. And only B trees can be declared as unique. Indexes can be built concurrently. Um, when you build a normal index, it will lock the table for the duration of the index build, but you can build it concurrently. And in that case, it doesn't take out a right lock against the table. It creates an index, marks it as invalid, and then starts building the index in the background. When it's done, it will go back and handle any changes that have occurred since it started that index. Once it's done, 
then it flips the index to mark it as valid, and then the query optimizer will, will um, be able to use it. it query, optimizer, query planner won't use an invalid index. It often takes a little bit longer because it's got to run through the data and then got to run through it again, and there's contention, there's other locks that are happening, versus when you just build an index normally, it's got an exclusive lock on the whole table and can just read everything. Just be aware that if you're using versions of Postgres less than that, I'm not going to list them all, um, if you're using anything in that major block and you're using that, just be aware that there is a possible build corruption on when you're using concurrent indexes. The last I checked, there wasn't any known instances of it, but it doesn't mean that it won't happen. All right, so if we have a look at constraints that become indexes, the most obvious one is a primary key. If you declare a primary key on a table, it will implicitly create an index in the background for you. All right, so if you do a lookup on the primary key, there's an index to back it. Exclusion constraints, that's a discussion for another, it's another entire talk. Uh, actually, there was a talk on constraints. Yep, and that was actually handled there. Um, so if you do alter table, add constraint, exclude using, it will also build an index. In that case, you actually sp you can specify the type. Sometimes you actually want to use a gist or a gin as building that constraint, because you're using ranges most often in that case. And then unique constraints that also builds an implicit index. So that begs the question, why have unique constraints and unique indexes if the unique constraints create a unique index for you in the background? First off, they are functionally similar, as in whether, if you build one or the other, they will act the same. And again, a unique constraint will create a unique index in the background. And the reason we have both is because a unique index can have a where clause where the unique constraint cannot. So if you have a unique constraint, it's on that entire table, uh, the entire column as a whole. Whereas if you want to have a conditional where uh, unique constraint, so you want something unique where some other column value is a certain value, then you can utilize a unique index. But for most cases, I would recommend that you use a unique constraint, okay? Unless you need to do a partial index with a where clause in the index, then use a unique index. Don't create both. It's a waste of space and time. I say space because you now got two indexes. I say time because there's now two unique constraints to check, two indexes to maintain, two indexes to run through the whole time. If you ha so let's say you've got an existing table, but you want to add a unique constraint to it. Add a unique constraint will lock the table. So how do we add a unique constraint to a table without locking it? This is the simple way to do it. You create a unique index concurrently. Let that finish building. Then you alter table, add unique constraint using that index. It then won't build its own index. It'll just use the one that you already created. So that's a neat, neat little trick to add a unique constraint to a table later down the road. When you've actually got too many rows, then you can't afford the lock. Foreign key constraints do not create an automatic index. So this is the one constraint type that does not. And the reason is because there are a lot of index types to choose from. If you're talking unique, it doesn't matter. B-tree is the only one that supports unique, so that's fine. If you're doing uh, exclude using, you're telling it the exact type of index you want to use, it knows what to build. With a foreign key constraint, do you build a uh, B-tree? Do you build a gin? Do you build a gist? Sometimes you can use more than one. Sometimes with geometry it's obvious, but with other types you don't know. Although you shouldn't be doing foreign key with geometry. But I will suggest you consider adding one. Okay? And the reason for that is it improves the speed of delete and update operation on the reference table. So if you have table one with a foreign key to table two and you go and delete a row from table two, with that foreign key. It goes back to table one and makes sure that that row is not referenced in table one. If you don't have an index on table one for that column, it's going to sequentially scan that entire table to make sure that you're not violating the foreign key by deleting a row in table two. So if you create a foreign key constraint, create an index. That's just the one reason. The other reason is when it starts merge joining or hash joining between the two tables, it's better to do it when you've got an index on both sides. It gives the query planner a bit more choice. And okay, an index-only scan. So we've spoken about how an index can 
you look up a value in an index and then it goes and finds it in the table. But if you are, if you for instance, create index name on table column one and you say select column one from table, the database will scan that, co that index and return it as is without ever touching the data in the table itself. It's got no reason to. I've asked for the exact thing that's stored in the index. And the index is very fast, so it queries it and returns that value. So if you, if you ever do an explain on a query and you see index only scan, that's what's happened. You can order by index. I've mentioned that indexes are sorted and that they give you an, an ordering. So if you say select star from table, order by column one ascending, then it already gets the data. As it scans the index, it's getting it in the, in the sorted order already. So then as it's querying the data from the table, it's already got it in an implied or an implicit sorted order. Only works with a B tree index. You can also do it with, with multi-column or compound or composite, whatever term you want to use. And you can specify different ordering. So you can say column one ascending, column two descending, and then have it in the order by, and it will again use the index. Just a note, check where you, where you specify your column name in a where clause. So for instance, if you say select star from sales where now is greater than the sale date plus 30 days, it will not use the index. The second one where you say select star from sales where the date is greater than now minus 30 days, functionally identical, will return the same results, but only the second one will use the index. And the reason is, on the second one, the value on the one side of, on the, in the, your case, on the right side of the greater than is a constant. Because now it's stable, it returns that, it works out an exact timestamp, it becomes a constant, and then it's able to utilize it. Whereas with the first one, we are saying, take whatever the column value is, add 30 days and compare it to now. So for every single row, it has to go and fetch that out and then do the comparison. Do not over-index. Having too many indexes will slow down your insert, update, and delete operations because every time it has to go into every index and update them. Check where, your, where indexes are not being used. So select star from PGStat user indexes. Have a look at the index scan, tuple read, and tuple fetch. If they are zero, that index is probably not being used. And try to combine your indexes where possible. So if you're indexing on column one and you've got another one indexing on column one and column two, the first one's unnecessary. Just a, a note on the building of indexes. In your postgres.conf file, the maintenance work mem value is utilized for a couple of things within the database, but one of them is for the building of indexes. So if that value is too small, then it's going to end up writing the entire value or the entire index to disk as it's busy processing. If you... Um, if you increase that value, then it's able to store the entire index in memory as it's busy building it, as opposed to constantly writing it to disk. But don't make maintenance work mem more than the amount of memory that would actually be, be available, or your operating system is going to start swapping to disk, and then it's effectively the same as having a low maintenance work mem. Uh, just a quick note on partitions, tables, and indexes. Before Postgres 10, indexes had to be created on each of the child tables, um, or 10 and lower. From 11 onwards, the parent table will propagate that through to the children, which is actually very nice. So if you have, if you have partitioned tables, you create it once on the main definition, and then every time a partition is created, it creates the indexes with it. So that's a nice thing that they've added now with 11. It also applies to unique indexes. Any questions? Right. Stripey shirt. Sorry, um, you mentioned the fact that, uh, let me just get my story straight, that the indexes will be stored in, a, in an ordered manner. Just mark a little closer. Uh, sorry, the indexes will be stored in an ordered manner. Yeah. Uh, certain types are. Certain yes. types. Those certain yes. types. What determines that order? Is it in terms of the file structure that Postgres uses? That's going to a very deep level. Um, no, I'm asking because no, you're going to get a difference no. between spinning disk and SSD. The thing is, most indexes in any case are usually read into memory, okay? And then they read they're in that, that, that balance tree, they take a B tree. They're in balance, a B tree structure within memory. 
So Postgres will always attempt to get the, the indexes off disk and into memory. Okay, then we don't really care about how they are on disk. But indexes are written in a similar manner to how tables are stored. There's just a little bit more metadata in to allow it to actually build the tree from that. Yes, but if you've got a very large table or large data volumes, and it's actually doing a, an index seek, yeah. then obviously the way it's ordered on the disk itself is going to matter. It, yes, but that's where the metadata comes in. So okay. the index, so with, I mean, it, it, that's really going into a deep level. Um, you can not, don't have a lot of time. But the, I mean, every, every row, if we just look at the table structure, every row of data has a bunch of metadata that describes it as well. An index has a little bit more to it. And that's what would help Postgres essentially con reconstruct the B tree from this stuff, no matter where it is on the disk. Because it would still, the, the disk storage doesn't stay ordered, it's the structure that stays ordered, if that sort of makes sense. Okay. It's, yeah, it's a little bit too in-depth right now, but I can talk to you a little bit just now. Okay. There's another question over there. Okay. So, that's a challenging question, because that's coming from David. Okay. Um, for, the, for the Brin index, uh, oh, talked yes. about the importance of keeping, of having ordered data. Yes. Um, uh, but when you do updates in Postgres, um, it will <laughs> stick know, your I, row somewhere else. So that's what I said, yes. And that's yeah, what clustering is. If you have, so even, even if it's not the Brin indexed column that's updated, if it's an update intensive or even moderately update yes. intensive uh, table, is it best to avoid Brin? Yes, is it would be. Because then your data, your, your, your physical storage on disk becomes out of order. Right. So, so if you're only ever inserting and never updating or deleting, Brin is perfect. But if you're updating, then you're creating these little gaps, and then your ranges start getting broader and broader, and the index over time becomes useless. Okay, thanks. Right. Okay, thank you very much.